All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is April 29th, 2022. And brothers and sisters, if I remember correctly, it's like 45 or 46 days left to this intense date that we are looking for. I think at that point it will equal the seventh Sabbath in the Feast of Weeks. And from that day forward, we'll begin the 50-day count, which will be a time where everything on earth, from everything that's been revealed in Scripture, everything is about to change. This will be the beginning of the end of days. Are we, are we already, in a sense, in the end of days? I don't want to confuse people and, and get them thinking that we're in the end of days in that sense, but... We are in, in a big picture sense, okay? The, the big picture is 777. Seven, seven. You see, there's a reason why cards, you got 21, right? The game, there's slot machines and seven. It, why was seven? Why triple sevens is such a good thing, okay? It is 777. Seven, seven. That is the big picture. And it's not only the big picture of the end of days, it's the big picture that we've got a, a video on, which is the fractal, because all of creation from the beginning that said in the beginning is a 21,000 year story. When the, when the millennial reign is done, it will have been 21,000 years. And the 22nd year or that 22nd thousandth year is the beginning of eternity. When the new heaven and the new earth come down, when the old one is destroyed and it's over. Man, we're not that far from that. You know that? We're literally about 14 years and then a millennium. <laughs> we don't have to worry about that, right? Those who are the bride of Christ, the sons and daughters of God, right? Those who have the spirit of God in them. No fear, because we're right in this period of time right here. You see, the first seven years are... They're fast passing. It's, it's as if you wouldn't even know you were in tribulation. You remember the story of Jacob and his wives and then working for the cattle. He was with his father-in-law for a total of 20 years. And when the 20 years was over, at the end of those 20, he made a covenant with his father-in-law in that final year. It's the story of creation. It's, it's, it's the story of the end of days. And it's all a fractal. The whole story is a fractal, is a fractal, is a fractal. It repeats and replays different characters with similar type situations the whole way through in the was, the is, and the is to come played out over multiple scenes. You know, we're going to, as we go forward into today, we're going to be touching on some of those things because we are going to get into some deep stuff, but not, not so deep that it's, we're going to go too far deep, but deep in the sense that as you see these things, knowing what you already know, you're going to begin as we go through the surface and a little bit below the surface of some of these things, you're going to see these, these connections and these moments that are going to make you say, what? And that's why I was bringing up this, this whole going all the way back to the creation because I'm so fascinated by it in, in the revelation that we started receiving late last year in understanding the beginning, all the way back to the word in the beginning, which means in Christ, God created. In the beginning, God created. Okay, that's going all the way back. We saw that in John, right? John chapter 1 says he was in the beginning was the word. Then he was made light and then he was made flesh. That's the creation story. There was the beginning. Then he was made light and then the first Adam was made flesh. I'm not saying the first Adam was Christ, but he was made flesh. The first Adam, okay? Christ is called the last Adam. It was beginning, which is the spirit realm. Then it was light for the light realm, and then it was flesh. And where are we living now, brothers and sisters? We are living in the time of flesh. 
We've talked about this before, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that today as we go in. But we're going to cover a, a, a couple of things before that that are really just awesome connections and will lead us right into this. It's so exciting. I, I love going into that creation story deeper now, in, into the creation stories deeper, now that we know who the Gospels are speaking to, right? And for those in this ministry that don't know what I'm talking about, when I say who the Gospels are speaking to, you, you want to come to watch this, okay? This playlist right here called the End Time, called the End Time Study Note Series. Let me just stop this for a sec. This is what we call the intro series that we want to introduce to everybody. Anybody that's new, anybody that's just beginning to understand, there was a reason why there are so many, so many confusing stories within the Revelation, or within the Gospels. You know, why does one say this and one say this and one say this, but it's supposed to be the same story? We've, told, we've been told all our lives it's just different perspectives, but it didn't explain away everything. They, they would fluff over it to make them think that because they just couldn't understand it. Well, that's the very first revelation this ministry got, and it started in September 2017. This is an intro to that. You're going to understand that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and the Synoptic Gospels, in the end of days, it goes Luke, Mark, Matthew. The first will be last, and the last will be first. You're going to understand um, that Luke is written to the bride of Christ, but that he knows everything. You're going to understand that Mark is written to the sleeping church. And some people say, well, the scripture doesn't say they're sleeping church. You know what it does say? To those that, that aren't ready, those that aren't watching, what do you call them? What do you call those who aren't watching and aren't ready? In fact, as we go into today's study, man, it's, it's going to be exciting. It's so awesome. As we go further into it, you're actually going to see a place where it says that they were in Christ. So how could you be in Christ yet having to go through these things? Sorry, sorry. They're the ones that weren't in Christ, but such as one, right? Kind of like uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. There are those in Christ, they're gone first. But there are those who know Christ, but they weren't in Christ. It's just a simple way of saying the sleeping church because they're not ready. They're not watching, right? He tells them, don't be asleep. Don't sleep. It's time to wake up and be watching. That's why you have that term for a sleeping church. You see, when you understand that Luke is to the bride, that Mark is to the sleeping church, which is the house of Israel is another way to say it, where the Gentiles are grafted in. And Matthew is to Judah. This video right here is your beginning intro into it, and it is going to blow your mind. If you have ever been confused reading the Gospels and, and frustrated with the differences in the stories, you will never be again. It's going to open it up and you're going to be so excited. You can also go to our website, ministryrevealed.com. The link is here on YouTube in the description box under the videos. You can download our book for free on PDF or you can read it from the website directly and you don't have to download. Or if you want a physical copy, you can go to Amazon and get the physical copy. It will go into greater details of the introduction to who the Gospels are speaking to, and I promise you, everything will change for you. You're going to be so excited, I promise you. All you got to do is spend 30 minutes to see if what I'm telling you makes sense and is true. From there, <laughs> you got to understand, this is an end-time ministry. This ministry is being given the open books. The, the book is opening in the understanding of the Revelation. And when you begin to understand these differences within the Gospels, you realize all of a sudden that, wait a second, now it makes sense. I mean, how, how was all of this going to fit into a seven-year tribulation? You realize it doesn't. The truth is that it's two sets of seven years. It's 14 years. This is what I was showing you a moment ago. See, the big picture is all of creation. You notice how there's seven, six days and the seventh is rest, and you had that in creation? and then. In creation, you have a thousand years, right? You got 7,000, 6,000, and then the seventh is the millennial reign rest. What about the years? <clears throat> Do you know that there are actually Shemitah years, right? We're in a Shemitah year right now. Even according to the Hebrew calendar, even according to the Jews, we are in the Shemitah year. And it just so happens that it's the seventh year. 
exactly where it should be for the escape of the bride of Christ, leaving only two more cycles of seven to go. And then it's what? Well, then it's the jubilee of the 50th year. It'll be the jubilee that will begin the millennial reign. <coughs> so what you come to see is that in creation, in, in the when Jesus is light, then you have the day's creation. And then when you go to chapter two, the day's creation is over and now it's thousand years creation. It goes from Adam and now it's a count of thousands that we're in. Because right now we're in this portion of time in all of creation. We're in the portion of the flesh. And we're approaching that 6,000th year. Okay, so we're living in the portion of time that is to Judah. Okay, the days are to Mark. But guess what the end of days, did you notice? We know that in Leviticus, it tells us, and I'm a little off track for a moment, but I'll be back because this is part of what we're going to be talking about. You see, in Leviticus, we know that not only is there days and then a Sabbath, six and seven Sabbath for days, and there's 6,000 years in the seventh and the seventh is, is rest, is the millennial reign, but we also know that there's Shemitah years. We also know that there's six years and the seventh rest. But where do you see it in the end of days? This isn't a picture of days. This isn't a picture of millenniums. This is a picture of years. There were seven, 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 seven that have already passed. We're in the fifth seven right now, leaving two more sevens before the final Jubilee year. This is the year when they will receive all of their lands. It's, it's perfect. It's perfect. It's exciting. Ah, man, keep watching. All right. And what ends up happening is when you begin to understand this, one of the first questions that comes about when you realize, you say, well, what do you mean there's two sets of seven? If there's two sets of seven remaining, are you telling me there's 14 years of tribulation? Yes, it's seven years of seals and it's seven years of trumpets. But the reason we never understood it is because of video number three. Video number three is called, It's All Because of Matthew. And the reason it's called All Because of Matthew is because brothers and sisters, all of our lives, we have been taught from the Gospel of Matthew. And the Gospel of Matthew has been the foundation of everything we see when we read anything in scripture. Do you know whose perspective we're looking through? Judah's. So when the church is telling everybody the tribulation is only seven years, it's because in their pre-trib thinking, they're leaving before the seven years of Matthew starts, the seven years of Judah starts. But because the church has never understood who Mark is speaking to, they've missed the seven years that is coming against them first. You see that? So what would that mean? That would mean where they think it's pre-trib and only seven years, count seven years left. Turns out when you realize the differences in the gospels and that it's 14 years, where the church thinks they're going pre-trib, guess where they are? You got it, mid-trib. The rapture of the great multitude is in the seventh year of seals. And then, it's the seven years of trumpets for Judah. This is how vitally important knowing who the gospels are speaking to is. This is how we know it's the revelation being given in the end of days for this ministry. It's been happening for four and a half years that we've been, we've been revealing these things. And so what's Luke's portion? Luke's portion was like Jacob when he worked the first seven years. He worked those first seven years and they flew by like days because he was so in love. And when he fulfilled those seven years, bang, give me my bride. But guess what? As you guys know, he didn't get Rachel, the one that he wanted. He wanted the younger one, but he got Leah first, the older one. And we've got a video that teaches that, doesn't, don't we? It's called the old before the new. And the answer to the old before the new, brothers and sisters, is the Feast of Weeks before the harvest 
of the great multitude. The pre-trib bride of Christ is the old wheat that is harvested. Not doesn't mean because it's old. It is the wheat harvested at the time of the Feast of Weeks. That is Leah. That is the bride of Christ who Christ didn't come for. Do you know why Christ didn't come for, didn't, in the typology, didn't come for, for the Leah type? Didn't come for the ready one? Because you see, Leah was ready. She was the older one. It had to be her. So she was ready. Do you know when Christ came in the same typology, he said he only came for the, for, uh, um, for, for the lost sheep of the house of Israel? Why not the found? Because they were already ready. He didn't come for the ready. They were already ready. He came for the what? I said this a moment ago. He came for the what? The lost. The lost must mean they were his. And they've stumbled and staggered along the way, being drunken and caught up in the things of this world. You follow? That's who he came for. That's his Rachel. That's who he's going to get at the time of the rapture. But Leah, the older, who was prepared, watching, and ready, who is his most loyal and devout, is going to go first. Brothers, all this and more in today's video and revealed for all of you guys in this intro series. It will blow your mind. All right? So let's get back to this. As I was already touching on some of the things we're going to be going into. But man, guys, you guys share so much with me. And it's such a blessing because when, when you have eyes to see and ears to hear and that, that circumcised heart ready to receive, to go and diligently seek these things, man, you guys are finding stuff all the time. And so many of you are in the forum now. You guys can go to the website right here. Uh, ministryrevealed.com. You can join us in the forum. There's like 950 people in there from all over the world sharing for prayers and and and, and uplifting and and watching for the day and and just all sorts of things. Sharing scripture, doing studies, and diving deep in. And many of you guys have been sharing in there. And um, you know, it doesn't cost anybody. Just so if anybody's wondering, anybody can come in and join. It's just a bunch of like-minded brothers and sisters watching and seeking the Lord and doing it together until that time. And, you know, with there's with so many things that you guys share, like I'm looking into this one. Uh, our sister Julie had shared this one with me, the alabaster box and how it's spoken differently within the stories before and after within Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Another sister has shared the difference with why the word exchange is only in Mark and Matthew, not in Luke, and the context of it. I mean, guys, this keeps going on and on. It's just awesome. Okay, so there's always things that we're looking at. You know, part of today's video was um, was uh, was a message I got from Jared, and uh, we, we were going back and forth, and I said, oh, my goodness, look at this, and we're going to talk about it today, and it was just mind-blowing how perfect it was. I'm so excited to share that one with you because it was just absolutely perfect. The timing of where it is in scripture to what we've been recently revealed in relation to, to Joshua, right? In relation to Moses first as seals and Joshua then for the end of seals going into trumpets. I mean, it's, it's incredible. There's that video old before new. The, the fractal video is down here. I mean, it's awesome. We're going to cover and talk about a lot of these things today. And so I'm going to share that one. That one was something with Jared. And then I went in and was digging and found something. And I, I sent him a message back and he says, of course, you know, it, it's so perfect. And then if, I was talking with Mike from uh, Interrupts 165. And he's, he's digging more into this creature, right? This second portion of creation, the creature in the creation of days. And while we're talking, I do a search on the word creation. Now, I could have done the search on create did, create something, but I chose the word creation. I don't know why, I just we were looking at these things with creature and, and the Lord saying that, you know, uh, um, 
uh, be made a new creature or creation. And so I'm looking it up and I type in the in a blue letter Bible search the word creation. And my jaw hit the floor. I was like, what? And I'm telling Mike and he's like, what? I, I almost thought I spelt it wrong. It didn't make sense to me that the word creation is only found six times in the Bible. And where it's found, it's going to blow your mind because the wording of it and where it's found is 100% accurate to the Gospels as to who it's speaking to and when in relation to creation and the groups in the end of days. <laughs> it's going to blow your minds. <laughs> this is how exciting it is, guys. So, man, I'm going to start first by... by um, building a little bit on what we talked about here in this last video, and then we're going to keep going forward from there. It's a perfect tie-in to get this all started. And again, <laughs> it's so funny. Again, it was by one of our sisters, I think it was Tammy, who posted in the forum how in the last video where I was sharing about 2nd Esdras, Right, Second Ezra's chapter 13, verse 29 through 44, and how this was about the escape of the bride of Christ. We've been talking about this for many years now, and this is the time of seals, and this is the time of the end of seals, and, and we spoke about Shulamanser and where it was in Scripture and the connection to it, and that they fled, right? Shulamanser, king of the Assyrians, is this typology of the Antichrist, and they're going to flee into the wilderness and the Lord is going to dry up the rivers. He's going to stop the channels of the river so that they can pass over. And we know that this means pass over as in at the time of Passover, just like it was with Moses. And that's what we were sharing in the last video for part of the teaching. And I explained that the Lord will do it again when they're returning. But I never showed you where it was typed on here. We'll check it out. I was sharing about it in this last video at one of the portions. And this is what Tammy had shared, the rest of the imagery. There it is. And so it says, listen to this. Um, this is when they had to flee into the wilderness. And what we know here in this ministry is this portion that it's talking about when they had to flee from that Antichrist type character, it's going to be about two and a half years into SEALs. This is when they flee into the wilderness. In fact, it's so awesome. This chart is called the chapters to years. And it's so awesome. You can go into John chapter 10 and it talks about, and if another comes in, but not through the gate, right? He's the imposter. Uh, uh, he's a, there's a wolf and so forth. That all starts in John chapter 10. Right at the typology of time frame of when the Antichrist will step forward to continue with his great power and authority that will be the time of the mark of the beast that will be the time when mark's group which is the 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 um sleeping church the the house of israel with the gentiles grafted in who who weren't ready when the lord came they were still caught up in the things of the world they weren't in christ but they were like that's the group there's going to be some lost during the time of seals and there's going to be many more coming in that's why it's going to be a great multitude rapture in the seventh year. So when you see this, this is Mark's discourse. This second in the third year, which is two and a half years in approximately, is when the Antichrist is going to get his power to continue for 42 months to the end of the sixth year of seals when he's then destroyed. So what you see in Mark is the group who flees into the wilderness and it's the Moses typology when they flee into the wilderness and they'll be crossing over, right? They were fleeing from this Shulamanser, this Antichrist type, and they had to pass over and this channels of water were stopped. And it was Passover. And when they return, when they're going to return in the seventh year, you see, they're going to see the Lord coming at the end. They're going to see this mountain of the Lord coming at the end of the sixth seal. When the Antichrist is destroyed, that battle takes place, the Ezekiel 39 war. And then what happens? The rapture of that great multitude doesn't happen right away. 
it doesn't happen till about six months into the seventh year you know five to seven months about six months into that seventh year of seals which will be at the time of passover so they fled at passover two and a half years and after the three and a half years of the reign of antichrist having they have fled into the wilderness about six months later for a total of four years we'll have them what having to return at the time of passover and look at what it says here in second esdras uh chapter 13 verse 46 then they dwelt there until the last times this is prophecy brothers and sisters yes it took place but yes it's prophetic just like we've been showing it's the exact same story of the end of uh, of deuteronomy of the end of moses going into the time of the beginning of uh, of joshua taking over yeshua taking over and they shall uh then they dwelt there until the last times and now when they are about to come again the most high will stop the channels of the river again so that they may be able to pass over because it will be Passover again therefore you saw the multitude gather together in peace who are they the ones up here and as for you seeing him gather unto himself a mul- another multitude that was peaceable these are the ten tribes which were led away who are the ten tribes brothers and sisters the church the house of Israel grafted with the Gentiles it's so perfect it is so awesome it proves the revelation that we've been showing the whole time watch this watch this with um with joshua now we come into joshua and we see the same story remember what happened with joshua joshua who is the son of noon which means he is this is the second portion of Ephraim that's what Mike's been looking into we spoke a little bit in the last video Moses dies and it says now therefore rise go over this Jordan thou and all this people unto the land which I do give them even to the children of Israel okay now this is the beginning of Joshua watch this here we are now in the beginning of Joshua It's the same typology as if being at the end of seals. We're at the end of the six years of seals, and we're at about that two and uh, about that six months into the seventh year of seals when the rapture is about to take place. And what happens? They're about to cross over. He says, "Go and tell the people that within three days you shall pass over this Jordan." same story going on all right the exact same story is taking place then look what happens it's the story continues in joshua 1 2 3 4 and it's it's about them about to pass over and then in four the day before they pass over and then them passing over and then here we are in chapter in chapter 5 and it says you know the amorites and the canaanites these guys were they they were they were terrified because they heard that the lord had dried up the waters of the jordan before the children of israel until they were passed over that their heart melted neither was their spirit in them anymore because of the children of israel at that time the lord said unto joshua make these sharp knives and circumcise again the children of israel the second time now all the people came out were circumcised because remember when they went into the wilderness they all had to be circumcised first right now here they are coming out of the wilderness and they have to be circumcised before going into the land and how long were they in the wilderness for 40 years what did we show in a recent video about those 40 years when they were in the wilderness well if it's two and a half years at the middle in uh, about two and a half years when they flee into the wilderness because the tribulation of the 14 years will start at tishri two and a half years later in the third year will be at passover time they flee into the wilderness 
And how long are they there for? Well, according to the story of Moses, it took them what? Well, they left at the, at the, on the 15th day of Nisan. 15th day of the third month of the first month. And it said they got there on the third month, same day. That means it took them two months to finally get into the place of the wilderness. So by the time they fled and were in the wilderness, how long are they there for? Well, the Antichrist's reign is for 42 months. But it takes them two months to get to the wilderness. So how many months will they be in the wilderness? 40 months? 40 months to the same typology of the 40 years. Now, there's a reason why I'm building to this, okay? Because there's a couple things going on. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's a couple things going on. We just saw from 2nd Esdras this connection about them fleeing at Passover, which we know is about two and a half years in the seals, which is the time of Mark's discourse when they flee into the wilderness. And then we see the time of the great multitude rapture when they're coming back in the seventh year. And they're who? Well, they're not the old wheat. Okay, Leah was already taken first. This is the rapture of the new wheat, which is harvested in the fall but cannot be used and brought in until the second day of Passover. That's called the new wheat. There's old wheat and new wheat, winter wheat and spring wheat. We are the bride of Christ. Leah is the old wheat, is the winter wheat that could be used right away. It's exactly as the Jews do it. But I don't know that they fully understand the connection to end of day scripture because it's not to them. <laughs> That's why it's so fascinating. We can look to them to get greater understanding of Scripture. So we know that it's two and a half years into seals, and then we know it's the seventh year of seals at the midpoint. So that puts it, like we said, from right there into this one, the four years later. When they fled, this is the Mark group. You see the Mark group, there's his discourse. And I'm, I'm reiterating that because we're going to see this exact portion of time but now what happens we're talking about now when they're passing over okay this story given to us in joshua in the end time revelation seals the six years of seals has now come to an end moses is died he's died and now joshua yeshua is taking them over what happens when he's now taking them over they've just passed over by the time you get to chapter 5 of Joshua, it's not like we're we're months later or a year or two down the road. We're just, we're like a couple days later, right? And look what happens. We get to chapter 6. Chapter 6, this is where I was talking about with, with um, in comments, in messages with Jared. And we see here, you get to chapter 6, and it's about the story of Jericho. Well, do you understand that they've just crossed over the Jordan? Again, not months, not years down the road. This is just like a few days later. They've just crossed the Jordan. Which means what? They're now in the promised land, right? Where are they? The, the great multitude rapture has happened. The great multitude rapture has happened, which means what? Which means the timing would be Revelation chapter 7. Here's the great multitude rapture. The great multitude rapture comes after the sixth seal and before the seventh seal. So the six years of seals have passed. They're in that seventh year. The great multitude rapture happens at the time of Passover. And now they've crossed over. So Joshua, Yeshua came at the end of the sixth seal, is bringing them over. Now they've crossed. So when they've crossed, where are they? Well, this is them here. The great multitude rapture that has come in. Then what happens? You get to chapter 8 of Revelation, and it says, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. I've taught on this many times. I believe that that typology <coughs> is the second half of the seventh year of seals. Okay? 
So the second half, which is about five to seven months or something like that. So when the seals come to an end, they're now in the land. They've crossed over the Jordan. The Lord brought them into the promised land. What comes next? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven trumpets. <laughs> I think I'm having voice cracks. Okay. What do we see? Seven angels, which stood before the Lord, having seven trumpets. What was it? Seven angels. Oops. Seven angels, which had the seven trumpets what do you think the typology is in the perfection of timing in the story of the end of days when seals come to an end because the great multitude has passed over which is in direct correlation to second esdras which is in direct correlation to our end time revelation which is in direct correlation to to uh, uh, um, Deuteronomy and Moses going to the end of seals and Joshua going for trumpets that it is seven angels with the seven trumpets seven angels with the seven trumpets you want to know why it's wild because when you get to Joshua 6 when they're now in the land listen to what happens how how this comes about is with Jared and I he, he was asking me about um uh, about the Ark of the Covenant and so that's another thing that I'm looking into. And I got sidetracked with this because his comment was that in the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament, it was just the, the, two, the two stone tablets. It was just the, the, the commandments. How come when you get to the book of Hebrews, it's Aaron's rod, the two stone commandments, and the, 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 the tray for manna? How did that happen? And that's what Jared was asking me. And so when I when I started going down this trail and I saw in Joshua 6 where it's talking a lot about uh and even in in Joshua in itself there's all of this talk about the uh about the Ark of the Covenant. But you see years ago or over the last few years I've told you guys before I haven't spent much time in Joshua and it was kind of on purpose and i've told you guys this because i knew that when i got to joshua it was going to be a typology of the time of trumpets and so i just never really spent much time in it until recently but i think the lord was holding me back from really going into it even though i knew what it was going to be he held me back because i didn't yet have the understanding that moses was the typology and them going and fleeing into the wilderness was the mark group was was the the mark group and and the the time of seals and then joshua as yeshua was them bringing them in in the seventh year of seals after moses dies and then it's the time of trumpets well you ready for this i'm sure you've already read it right here we are they've now crossed the jordan they're in the land and look what happens the seven priests given seven trumpets. The what? Then Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said unto them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets. What? You sh not sure? Seven priests bearing the seven trumpets. <laughs> oh, you're still not sure? And the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets. Guys, do you understand how much more confirmation all this stuff is? This is the evidence. This is flat out telling us. Look at this. The wording seven trumpets in all of scripture is only found in two places, brothers and sisters. The book of Joshua chapter 6. Only Joshua chapter 6. And Revelation chapter 8. Hello. <laughs> this was another one. I was just like, what? And you see, I, guys, this has been going on for four and a half years. This, this incredible excitement and joy at the revelation of seeing it 
all come together. <laughs> that that every time this happens, every time a, a new book is open or a new section of scripture is revealed, whether it's chapters to years or whether it's just the story within the book itself, whenever we have it revealed in the end time revelation, it continues and continues and continues and continues to bear fruit over and over and over again. The seven trumpets being where they are in the book of Joshua is absolutely 100% in alignment with the revelation of the end of days that when the six years of seals are done and Moses dies and Joshua takes over, brings them into the promised land, which is going to be on heavenly Mount Zion, which is going to be paradise, which is going to be that garden of Eden coming down. It will then begin what? The seven trumpets. Perfect. Every single time. I had to share that one with you guys. I was so excited by it. It was just one of those. You see, I, I didn't even go. When, when I did the this revelation of, of, of Noah, uh, sorry, of um, Moses, and this revelation of Joshua, I it was a lot of it starts, and it always starts off that way. It starts off a little bit surface revelation. We can clearly see because of what we've already understood in the Gospels, we can clearly see their portions of time. We can clearly see those events within them. And we can point to them by going to the stories. But then, like I said, we spend a little bit more time and we dig a little bit further and we dig a little bit further and boom, more reveals itself and more reveals itself. And what's the purpose of this? I've mentioned this before in relation to like this chapters to years. What's the purpose? What does it matter knowing that these stories are stories that relate to the end of days? One, it proves flat out, hands down, undeniable. If your faith is shaking as to whether scripture is true, hands down, this locks it, loaded, sealed, signed, delivered. It is all true. Because for the last four and a half years, we've been given revelation in Scripture through the study and the leading of the Spirit to open all of these books. And in all of these places where we've done this, they have all revealed parts of the end of days directly in their time. So for one, all of those people around the world who have lost faith, who have walked away from the Scriptures because they said they were written by men, corrupted by men, because, because th there's all of these contradictions. This ministry heals that. If we were able to reach everybody who left because of that, they would all come back. Because if that was truly the reason they left, because they thought it was a lie by men, because it was too corrupted, we would be able to bring them all back. That is how powerful this is. That's how powerful it is. But what else does it do? It gives us information. It helps leave information. It helps maybe prepare some of us for the work coming for the Lord. To understand these seasons and these times during this period of 14 years about to begin. They can know when to flee. They can know what to watch for. They can know how long they're going to be fleeing for. They'll understand the time of when they'll go in the great multitude rapture within a frame of time. They can understand what's coming next and what to be aware of. It's almost like this is something the prophets might use because if they're given this information, plus with what the Lord will, will conclude by giving them, you see, we're laying out the revelation of the end of days. This ministry is the roadmap of the end of days and all of the little tidbits can be pulled from these chapters and verses of information that is within them that relate to each of the years during the tribulation. 
That is gangbusters awesome. That, it's killer, man. And when you understand it, most of you get just as excited as I do. Maybe in a in a quiet, reserved way. Maybe in a in a shouting to everybody way. We're all on our different spectrums of excitement and how we how we voice it. But when you understand these things, it just continues to blow your mind, and you think, "Oh my lord, is this possible? Are we really revealing? Are we really being given all of this understanding?" Absolutely, it's not even a question anymore. This has been happening hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times over and over and over in this ministry. It's powerful, powerful stuff, and it's so exciting. Watch this. Now watch this, okay? Now, we're going to keep going into this creation story. Remember, remember. This this portion of time that we've been talking about is up to the point when the seven trumpets are about to blow, which means right here. So what we've been talking about is really from the time they flee into the wilderness till the end of seals, when they come back and cross over the Jordan, and then the seven trumpets are about to blow. Okay? So you can see this is a, a portion of Mark's time of the sleeping church, house of Israel, right? The Gentiles grafted in. This is the portion of time that we're talking about here. And we just brought more revelation to confirm that indeed they flee at Passover and they will be raptured at Passover, which confirms many of our other recent videos because there are three feasts to the Lord. And the three feasts of the Lord, of course, are Passover, Feast of Weeks, and Tabernacles. But the first isn't Passover. We've revealed that it's the Feast of Weeks. In the beginning. Well, the beginning was Taurus. The beginning was where now Savan is. That is the beginning. That is also where the Lord God made his first covenant with man. That is the harvest of wheat, the winter wheat harvest. Which is the old that can be taken and used right away. That is Leah, the old that goes before the new. And we're going to talk about some deep things as it keeps going because you're going to understand, as I was saying earlier, that when Christ came, he came for the lost. He didn't come for those that were already found. He didn't come for those who already were looking and watching and prepared and ready. He came for the lost, which means he came for his own. Because to, to be lost means you had to have belonged to him in the first place. You see? So then why, if he's coming for the Mark group, why is the bride going first? Why is the Leah, the old, going first? Because that portion of time is coming to an end. It is over. That's why the bride must be taken out first. <clears throat> the time of the spirit comes to an end in that sense. That's why at the red horse rider, which is when the tribulation begins, it says peace was removed from the earth. The Holy Spirit is then removed from the earth. And only those who receive it at what we call Acts 2.0 which is just before, right at the time of this starting. <clears throat> They're the only ones with the Holy Spirit that are going to go out and do these things again for the great multitude rapture that we're talking about here in Mark's group of seals. But I don't want to get too ahead of myself. We're going to go into that in even greater detail. But now watch this. Remember I was telling you, I was talking with Mark and and he was looking at this info for the creature <clears throat> and wanted to dig more about it going back to the creation story. And so as we're talking, we're looking for this creature or creation. You know, we're a new creation in Christ. Is that what it says? Or is it a new creature in Christ? And so I search up creation. Okay. Just as you see here. Results for creation. 
And when I told Mike after I looked at it, I was confused. I was like, I could have spelled it wrong because it shows up here. But it only shows up six times. And where it showed up, I thought, oh my goodness, it's perfect. Ready for this? Ta-da! The word creation in all of Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, not the word created or those different variations, but the word creation. It's not, not only is it not only missing from the book of Genesis, where the creation is, it's not even found in any of the Old Testament. It's found six times in the entire scripture. And look at the gospel it's found in. Boom, perfect. When I saw this, after I finished scratching my head saying, what? When I saw where it was and I was talking to Mike and explaining where it was, it was awesome. Because the only place the word is found is in the gospel of Mark which is 100% accurate. Watch this. Now I said, well, what if I look up the actual word? Like, what's the word definition? Okay, for the word creation. Well, when you go look up the word for, for creation, it's the Strong's word, 2937. So it's in the Greek. So you're only going to get now in the New Testament. But it's not only the creation that we found here that's only six times. It's also creature found 11 times. Do you know why? Because the creature is from that portion of creation. New people, you're going to be scratching your heads on this one. But if you watch some of these older videos where we start to reveal this, it's going to blow your mind and it starts to get heavy. And then we're going to go even a little deeper and heavier. Watch this. Creature and creation. So now maybe with all of these options, we'll see it in you know, in Mark or Luke or or we'll see it, you know, somewhere in other Gospels. Well, guess what? No. You see it in one more spot in Mark in relation to creature instead of creation and creation. All three places that relate to the creation of the world. What's the world, brothers and sisters? What's the world? It's the house of Israel. And the Gentiles grafted in. It was the creation of days. Right? It was the creation during the days. This is awesome. Are you ready for this? Let's go to Mark chapter 6, okay? Uh, Mark chapter 10, see? Creation, Mark chapter 10, verse 6. The only place this is worded in the New Testament is in the Gospel of Mark. If we look at the chapters to years, you see Mark? Mark is the typology of seals, is Moses' time. This is in the creation story. We've been teaching that Mark's portion is the creation that was during the days, right? The creation of days, one, two, three, four, five, six, seventh day the Lord rested. It's the Mark portion. Well, let's see if that's true. What does it say? Mark 10, verse 6. Let's go to Mark 10, verse 6. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. <laughs> for those that have been following for a while, you're like, what? For those that are new, you're scratching your head and saying, what? <laughs> it's awesome, guys. When you understand this, it is mind-blowing. <clears throat> because where is it? It's down here, right? And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created, see, not creation, created he, him, Male and female created he them. We've been told all of our lives that this is Adam and then Eve. It is not true. We've explained this. We've revealed it so many times. It is no different than Matthew, Mark, 
and Luke, brothers and sisters. We know that because we have all been taught from the Gospel of Matthew for hundreds of years as the foundation of all teachings, that every time we read something, even going into creation, we believe it's only a total of 7,000 years. But if the end of days has revealed to us that the end isn't only seven years, but the church believes it's seven years only of tribulation because they read from Matthew and they think they're going pre-trib and then there's only seven years for, for Judah. And now you know that there's actually a first seven years, which is for Mark. What do you think it means about creation? It means that if there's a 7,000 years of which we're living in right now and about 14 or so years away from the 6,000th year, because we're living in Matthew's portion of thousands from the creation of Adam, then what do you think that means in the creation for Mark? Do you think maybe if the true end of Revelation, when you understand that it's not a foundation in Matthew, but it's Matthew, Mark, and Luke speaking to different groups, that if everything you learned was only a seven years of tribulation, and it would mean a seven years of creation, well, when you realize that it's not seven, but it's 14, you realize that the creation has more than one 7,000 year run in it. It has two. And the answer for Mark's isn't Matthew's. It's Mark's. And so if Matthew's 7,000 years of creation is from Adam, and that would mean what? Mark's 7,000 had to come before Matthew's, had to come before Adam. And this is what we've talked about recently. This is for new people. You see, they were what? Day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six. You get to chapter seven and it says on the seventh day, he rested. And then what do you have? Then he makes man from the dust of the earth. He makes Adam and he places him in the garden. We're going to talk about this in a moment. And from Adam, we have what? The 6,000 years, right? To the 7,000, the millennial reign of rest. We are living in the portion of time in the flesh. But we are not all fleshly beings. Hello. We're not all fleshly beings. We are all covered in the skins. But we are not all flesh. And I'm going to show you a piece of scripture later on as we keep going that is going to confirm this and blow your minds. Because you're going to read that that says that they which are of flesh are earthly. That they which are of the earth are earthly. And that they which are of heaven are heavenly. They that are, they that are. That means there are some for heaven and there are some for earth. Who are the ones for the earth? The Adam group. Which create which portion of creation is Adam? Matthews. We're living in the thousands of years since Adam. But the Mark group is the creation of days. The Mark group is the day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six. And what happened on day six? It said God created he, him male and female. And these are days. Let me show you for somebody who's new. When you go to 2 Peter 3, 8, listen to what it says. There's a reason it's back. It reverses itself. It says, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. So don't be ignorant. Don't, don't miss this one thing. It's so important. That one day. What was one day? Day one, day two, day three in Genesis one. One day is with the Lord as a thousand years. 
So that means day one in Genesis 1, day one, day two, day three, they're a day to the Lord. But it's what? As a thousand years. So that means day one was like a thousand years. But to the Lord, it was a day. Day two was as 2,000 years, but as two days to the Lord. This is the Mark group. This is the creation of days that are to him, uh, that would be as to us like thousands. And then from Adam, we are now living in the thousands, right? We're coming up soon to the 6,000th, and then it'll be the thousand millennial reign. But to the Lord, they're what? As days. Why would he say it in reverse? Is it just because he likes hearing himself talk or, or likes to add words to scripture? No. It's because the creation of days are like thousands of years and the thousands of years that we're living in are as days to him. So when we bring this to Genesis, what do we see? We see the Mark group during the days, one day, two day, three days, four days, five days, six days. And it's on the sixth day that he creates them. And when he creates them, he creates them what? Male and female. If this is a typology of seven days as end time seven years, or in the creation story, they would be as millenniums, then it would be the same seven. And who is it to? The sleeping church, Mark, the house of Israel, the Gentiles grafted in. And what did we find about this creation story? This creation that's only found in Mark is telling us that it's the Mark group when he created them, male and female, in Genesis 1. Did you follow that? Did you follow that? So what does that mean? What, is, what does that do for the next seven? Well, what happens when you go to Genesis chapter 2? You have now Adam who's created. Adam is formed from the dust of the earth. He is the first what? Fleshly man. It is the beginning of flesh. And from Adam till even now where we're in, we are living in the thousands, but unto the Lord there as days. What is it all equal? Seven and seven. They are days to the Lord and days to the Lord. Thousands in the creation, if man was there visualizing it, seeing it, it'd be 7,000 to him. And then there's the 7,000 years that we're living in right now. Do you know what wasn't there? We just talked about the days to the Lord. So this is seven days of creation, 7,000. But they're all to the Lord like days. So it'd be like seven days and seven days. But to man, it would be 7,000 and 7,000. What's missing? Where's the years? Where's our year count? We have a day count of seven and seven. We have millenniums confirmed also in 2 Peter 3, 8 as 7,000 and 7,000. So we have days, we have millenniums, but... Where's the years? Right here, brothers and sisters. Right here. They are the end of days, years. They are the typology of creation to the end. They are the typology of creation from in the beginning of the millennial reign all the way to the end. It's the whole story. But you notice... We're missing Luke, aren't we? We talked about this before. We're missing Luke. You notice, before all this revelation came to us about creation, 
We never had anything here for Luke. Just the big picture count, like Jacob's story. Do you know why we didn't have anything? Because these seven pass by like days. They are not tribulation, but they are part of the big picture count from creation. This is why <clears throat> when we go, as you guys know, we've been following for a bit. This is why when we go to Genesis 1, we see days, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. We go to chapter 2, we see the thousands that we're in. We know that the thousands for, for the creation of man, which is the flesh, is the thousands that we're in, and they're God's chosen people. This is why we're to pray for the Jews. This is why the Old Testament and everything is a story about the Jews. Because we're in their portion of time. But we're not all flesh. It is the Jews who are the flesh. They are earthly of the earth. We and the church, the bride and the church are covered in skins. But we are not earthly. We are heavenly. You see, so what did we get? We, we've got the days. We've got the thousands. But for those that are new, there's this theory that we've proven in this ministry and this theory that's been around for hundreds of years called the gap creation theory is believed that Genesis 1 verse 1 and 2 is, is, is a way to explain hundreds of millions or billions of years and dinosaurs and everything else. It's not true. This gap theory right here is the first seven right here. Everything is a fractal. It is all a bigger to a smaller to a smaller to a smaller. It's the entire revelation. It's why, it's why Jacob <coughs> said that those first seven flew by like days. Why did he say they flew by like days? Because he was so in love and so excited to work for his bride. Why do we just have this short little blip of two verses for the first creation portion? Because it was Christ who was beginning to create. And he was so excited. It flew by. That's the answer. What was this first creation? It was those, as we've taught before, with the Spirit of God. It was the Spirit of God who moved over the face of the waters. And we know that waters can represent people. Now, does it mean there were people there? No, no. It was the spirit realm. And we've, we've said this before, right? Those who have the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Okay? So here we are. Looking at this word for creation, this word for creature, and we find it only in Mark. Do you know what the chances are that the only place it's found is Mark and it relates to the exact place that we've been saying that the day's creation that would be as thousands is to the Mark group? who Christ created. You see that? Now, did Christ create everything? Yes, he was over everything. But what was he? Christ was the firstborn over every creature. So what was he in creation? He was the beginning. He was the word. He was the beginning, the creation over the spirit realm. Then he was made light. When he was made light, this is that special creation for them. Because you know what happened here? These guys got corrupted. The creature became more worshipped than the creator. That's what we read in Romans. 
this is when the creature was created the male and the female christ was the true light who was over the entirety of these creation of days that would be as thousands this is the representation of mark this is the representation of the house of israel of the gentiles grafted in the sleeping church that he's coming to save this was the group corrupted by the false light <clears throat> it's perfect why because christ was made light he was the word in the beginning then he was made light and when he was made light there was corruption with a false light wasn't there and that false light was the chair of lucifer who corrupted this light and corrupted the male and female of this creation which is why christ has to come back to save them which is why he came 2000 years ago to save them and when he comes at the end the reason they're going through this tribulation of seals is because they're still lost there's still the final portion that needs to come in and they weren't ready that's why they're going through seals that's the mark group going through seals and the antichrist who is the lucifer type that'll be over them when the mid portion comes and they flee to the wilderness don't believe me <laughs> are you ready for this the other place the word creation is found is in mark chapter 13 verse 19. just in case you guys think i'm blowing smoke and you're not too sure what's going on here how about this <laughs> It's it's unbelievable. What was it again? <clears throat> Verse 19. Okay. Remember the abomination of desolation spoken of in Mark? This is the one about the mark of the beast when the Antichrist comes, when he gets his power to continue 42 months. We've been teaching on this for years. When they flee into the wilderness at the time of Passover, like we've been sharing for years, and I just explained is right here at about the two and a half year mark. Do you know what it says? Watch this. Verse 19. For in those days shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created unto this time. That word, not only the word itself being only in Mark, but the actual definition that could mean creature, creation, is only found in mark and in the discourses where it's found is exactly the same reference to the males and females in the creation of days that got corrupted by the false light of lucifer who is the typology of antichrist in the end of days against the house of israel against the church the world during the time of seals and the other place we find the word is at the midpoint of seals when the one who is the embodiment of lucifer the false light comes onto the scene during luke's discourse no during matthew's discourse no during mark's discourse are you understanding what's being revealed here <laughs> ah, i love it it love it it blows my mind it blows my mind how awesome this is how much the spirit has given us and led us into understanding it is freaky and we've got over 400 videos revealing this more and more and more and more 
the only part that's ever changed that's still been confusion to us was the 70th year of israel that's 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 the, that's the thing that may turn some people away but because they don't understand what is happening in this ministry we are revealing the open book of the is to come and what is included in that is a trying to also understand when it will begin of course we want to understand when it begins we got the timing we have the understanding of the events we got creation now all the way to the beginning don't you think it would make sense to try to understand when of course it does you know why because we were told it was the 70th year and if the 70th year passed well we had to figure out what the answer to that was and when we found it i thought that it was once the three years were over right that leviticus 19 said when you come into the land three years it's uncircumcised you can't touch it so i thought it related to the end of three years which was last year <coughs> but it wasn't it's in the fourth year it's holy to the lord it's a harvest celebration in the fourth year is what it says and we are in the fourth year right now or really we are in the 70th year because when they came into the land it was 48 to 49 49 to 50 50 to 51 51 to 52 brought to the lord and then it says the fifth year forward is theirs which means from day one in 52 began the 70 year count that means in 2021 to 2022 where we are as i'm speaking to you right now we are in the 70th year no questions no doubts no possibilities other than that right now that was that was something we'd been missing and do you realize that all of this year even from a portion of late last year We've got videos from January 7th of this year where we were showing that it's all this year. All we've been looking for since late towards the late portion of last year. The focus of the understanding has been it will be the Feast of Weeks. And from that point forward, I did get a word from somebody, by the way. I'm not going to go into it now. And I got it back on January 8th. I just, I'm not going into it. but. What ended up happening is that's been our focus and what's happened ever since it's been greater and greater and greater detail to the feast of weeks to the eighth day circumcision of john that that eighth day circumcision john being born i believe at the time of the seventh sabbath and the eighth day which is after seven on the eighth day which is the circumcision is when the bride of christ will be taken guys look at this it proves out the creation even more once again it's proven out the creation in both of these cases they've pointed back to Genesis 1 and the creation of days. And this one's timing in Mark 13 is directly related to the one who corrupted the light beings that were created in the days. This group that Christ became light, that he was the first one over that creation, which was light, they corrupted it okay let me show you something remember what i said earlier <clears throat> we've taught on this too that john tells us in the beginning was the word <clears throat> okay in the beginning was the word genesis 1 uh where is it genesis 1 of course we have in the beginning which is Christ, the Word. So in Christ, the Word, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay? First thing that was created was that spirit realm as well, which was where the Spirit of God moved. 
Then what do we read? John says, um, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness. Did you hear that? To bear witness of the light. To bear witness of the light. John wasn't that light, but he came to bear witness of that light. What was John? A witness. He bear witness. He was a witness of what? That light. Well, if John was a witness of that light, when was the light created? Genesis 1 verse 3, and God said, let there be light. Who was this light? Of course, as we know, this light was Christ. Well, wait a second. I thought Christ was the beginning, that he was the word. He was. You see, we've been told that he was the beginning over all creation, and he was. But he was also the beginning over every portion. He was the beginning over the spirit realm. He was the beginning over the light beings, the males and females created in his image. What were the images? Light. They were all light. Maybe some sort of being thing underneath, but they were light. Christ was light. We know this by the enemy because the one who corrupted them was what? The false light. He was also light. What do you think these guys were? This creation, this Mark group, this creation that got corrupted by Lucifer that Christ had returned to save when he came in the flesh. He was coming to save this group that got lost from the creation in the days. This same typology is the Mark group. And guess what? There's Christ when he came as light. When he came as light, John was not that light. But what was he? He was a witness of that light. So if John was a witness, let's go to Genesis 1. If John was a witness, which means he already had to be there, a witness can't show up later, okay? A witness shows up first. And what do we know about John? John was born before Christ. So John was a witness to the light. The only way John could have been a witness to the light is if he was part of the beginning. Which means John had to be part of the group that had the Spirit of God in him. How else could he bear witness of the light when we look at the typology in creation? Do you know how? We know exactly how. Because in Luke chapter 1, we have John the Baptist who is born, right? John the Baptist is born. We know that after he's born, we read about his circumcision on the eighth day. On John's circumcision on the eighth day, so if he's born around this time right here, the eighth day right there, this whole circuit of the sun connection that we've been talking about, this is the time frame of the escape of the bride of Christ right here, okay, depending where you live in the world. This is John's circumcision date, okay? What do we know about John? Remember when Mary came, right? We know that John, uh, uh, Mary, uh, uh, um, Elizabeth, there it is right here. The babe leapt in her womb and Elizabeth was what? Filled with the Holy Ghost. 
See? John had what in him from birth? John had the Spirit of God. So from birth, John had the Spirit of God who was able and was there before Christ to bear witness of him being the light. Brothers and sisters, who is the typology of the bride of Christ that we've been teaching for the last few years? John the Baptist. John the Baptist in Luke chapter 1 at his birth. This is exactly what we've been teaching for like three years. That the eighth day at John the Baptist's circumcision on the eighth day, John's father, was his mouth was loosed. And what does he say? Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. Do you know what happens after the bride, this, this Luke in order, one, two, three, four, that we've been teaching for years now too, two and a half, three years? What happens when we get to Luke chapter two and you have this typology of the son of man here for 40 days in the typology of his birth? What do we end up finding out? That he is going to be what? A light to lighten the Gentiles. <laughs> <laughs> who's first those who have the spirit of god who were of witness to him being light and when this bride is taken when the john typology is taken those who have the spirit of god are gone the son of man is here for 40 days and what is he a light to lighten the gentiles a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of the people of Israel. It's the house of Israel and the Gentiles grafted in. Who are they? Mark's group. Those who need to be saved. Those who still need to be rescued. Those who need that light to be lit inside. Check this out. What do we know about John? We can hammer this out all day, guys. What do we know about the Gospel of John? 21 chapters as the 21,000 typology, but in the end of days, it plays out with things within it that we have taught on many times. We've got teachings devoted to it. What do we see on chapter 8? What do we read in chapter 8? Let's go to John chapter 8. We've taught on this many times, but you're going to see something you've never seen or that you have never understood in this light before, pun intended. <laughs> so what do we see? We've talked about this many times, right? Jesus went, Jesus went under the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. We know from Luke's discourse, watch this. We know from Luke's discourse, it's the only one that ends like this, you see? Those who will be accounted worthy to escape all these things and to stand before the Son of Man. Listen to what it says next. And in the daytime he was teaching in the temple, and in the night he went out and abode in the mount that is called the Mount of Olives, and all the people came early in the morning to hear him in the temple. Isn't that what John 8 just said? So who's brought to him? Should be the bride of Christ, right? The typology should represent the layout, those with the Spirit of God, before the portion of light begins. Listen to what it says. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman taken in adultery. <clears throat> what does this mean, brothers and sisters? It just means the Gentile bride. That's what it means. Okay? Remember, for those that are new and haven't heard me say this before, what it means, it's like uh, uh, um, Ruth. Ruth by the kinsman redeemer. Ruth, who is a Gentile. Okay? When you read, she says, 
why is it that you have such an interest in me, a stranger? The word stranger that she identifies herself as is an adulteress. Is it because she's some adultering whore? No. It's, a, it's an expression, believe it or not, for Gentiles. All right? Why is that an expression for Gentiles? Because we're living in the flesh portion of Judah. We are living in the portion of thousands to God's chosen people. And so Gentiles are dogs and adulterers because they don't know the ways, right? That's why they had to be grafted in. And so look what happens. They bring to him a woman caught in adultery. And we read this story. And Moses commanded in the law that she should be stoned. Jesus goes on and he says, um, so when they continued asking him, he lifted himself uh, and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. Okay, who's the only one without sin? Christ. What do we believe this stone cast is coming? I believe we're going to see it at some point during this right here. And I specifically believe we're going to see it around here. I don't know if the bride is going to experience it hitting, but we're going to see it coming. As Luke 21 says, men's hearts failing them for fear of looking after those things coming upon the earth. And at that point, we're to lift up our heads for our redemption draws nigh. Okay? And what does it say? Summertime. What's this right here? First day of summer. Hello. Hello. Okay? So this is that stone's cast. So again, the woman brought in adultery, the stone's cast. He stooped down on the ground and he's bent over, right? He's bent over, he stooped down on the ground and they're standing around him. And then they all leave feeling convicted and only Jesus is left alone. And remember, he's bent over, almost like he's bent over on one knee, writing on the ground. And everybody's left. And when he looks up, the only person he's looking at is the woman. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. This is a picture of the Gentile bride of Christ brought to the Lord, the timing of the stone's throw, and everything about to begin. We've been teaching this as the escape of the bride of Christ for about three years now, showing this revelation within the Gospel of Matthew, uh, uh, of uh, Matthew, not in, in the Gospel of John. Well, guess what? We've read what comes next many times. But if this is the typology of the bride, who are those who have the Spirit of God, who are circumcised and are a witness to the light, but are the ones that have the Spirit, then that means the light must be next, right? Are you ready for this? The heading even says it. I am the light of the world. Then Jesus spake again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. <laughs> Should I just stop the video right here? <laughs> it's the creation story, guys. It's the creation story revealed in the end of days, revealed to the beginning, revealed in Luke in order. Those who have the Spirit of God are a witness to the light. They are removed before the light comes. The light coming when Christ comes in the end of days typology, when Christ is coming at the beginning for 40 days at the escape of the bride of Christ. He is coming for 40 days as the son of man. He's going to be rejected. But there will be some who will know who he is or will believe in him. But he's not going to be running around saying, I am Christ. Hear me roar. <laughs> it's not going to happen. But he's going to be doing signs and wonders and miracles. And many will think he is Christ. But the vast majority of the church is going to call him Antichrist. Because they've all been taught from Matthew. And they think the first thing coming is Antichrist. Why? 
because just like the Jews weren't ready when Christ came the first time because they were blinded, so is the church because their portion is seals. Their portion is light. The bride has the spirit of God in them. The church has the light. We are all living in the time of Adam, which is the flesh. And there are those of the flesh that are earthly and are meant to be. And there are those of the light covered in flesh who need to be awakened. And there are those who are of the spirit also covered in flesh. Because these two groups are both taken away. The fleshly group, the earthly group for those that are earthly remain on the earth. They're the ones who will be resurrected to live their promised millennial reign of peace on earth. They're heaven on earth. Not the kingdom of heaven. I mean, not the kingdom of God, but the kingdom of heaven. That is to Judah. That is to, that's to the, 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 the Adam creation of the flesh at the time of paradise. Watch this. Let's keep going. Watch this, watch this, watch this. Here it is in Romans 8. Okay? This portion, we've shared this on Romans 8 a number of times, but let me refresh and we're going to add to it. In Romans 8, look at what we read. Therefore, starting in verse 1, usually we start further down. Listen to this. Therefore, uh, sorry, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Do you know how powerful that one verse is to us, brothers and sisters? Ponder on this tonight. Read it again and again and think on what it says. There is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, even though we're in the realm of the time of flesh, but after the Spirit. Who are those of the Spirit? Those that are in Christ. Let me show you who are those in Christ. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 12. Remember, it's all in relation to the end of days. Here's our story of the 14 years that the bride goes above that 14 years. 14 years will start Tishri of this year. So at a portion of time before the 14 years, which is going to be in June, the bride of Christ is going to be taken. Are you ready? Listen to this. I knew a man in Christ. See that? What did we just read in Romans 1? That the one who is in Christ has no condemnation. They're the ones with what? With the Spirit in them. So what does it say about, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago? How they went to what? The third heaven. It's like a rapture. Those in Christ, which means those with the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God in them, are those going pre-trib, like a rapture, and they're going to be taken to the third heaven. But listen to what it says about the real rapture, about not the real rapture, but the actual rapture of the great multitude. It doesn't say they're in Christ. It says, and I knew such a man, like uh, sort of in Christ. They were kind of like these guys, but these guys were in Christ. These guys, they're kind of like them. That's why when they get caught up in their rapture, they go to paradise. 
Who are the ones that get to go first? Pre-trib? That's the Luke group. The Luke group are those in Christ. Who are those in Christ? Well, what did Romans 1 just say? Therefore, now no condemnation to them which are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after <coughs> the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. Did you hear that? For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. Who was the law created for, guys? The law was created for the Jews. The law was created during the time of what? Old Testament. From Adam. From the time of the creation of flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Why did Christ have to come into the flesh? Because we're all living in the portion of the time of flesh. Those with the spirit of God, those with the light, and those who are all flesh are living in the period of time of flesh. This is why we say <coughs> you share the gospel with everybody. Because even though there are three portions and three groups, you don't know who belongs to who. But when it's all done in their portion, the number and the percentage and the timing will all be perfect. There was never a delay. Not ever once was there a delay. It will all be in perfect timing. People that say delays is because they don't understand the timing of Scripture. And for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the spirit, but after the flesh. Uh, sorry, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. It's this constant thing. Flesh, spirit, flesh, spirit, flesh, spirit. Do you know why? Because for those who are in Christ, they generally love the book of Romans. Because the book of Romans is to the bride of Christ. That's why we are in the flesh, but we are the spirit. Let's keep going. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Well, do you guys know who can't please God? The Jews? Okay, they're in the flesh, right? But you are not in the uh, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. So it be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Let's go down to this part that we talk about all the time. Now it starts to become more clear again. For as many as are led. By the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So this whole thing is telling us spirit against flesh. Yes, you're all in the flesh because we're living in this time of the flesh. But you guys are spirit. And if you are the spirit, if you are the spirit of God, then you are the sons of God. Who are the spirit of God? Those from that first creation with the Spirit of God. You see, that entire first conversation, that entire conversation in Romans 8 is to the Spirit group who is living in the time of Adam's fleshly creation. And he's reminding us that you are of the spirit, not of the flesh. So don't get caught up in the things of the flesh. You see, what happens to the church? They get caught up in the things of the flesh. 
but they're to be light. And so their light needs to be turned on. And it would seem the only way to really turn on that light is by bringing devastation upon them. And the reason the Lord is doing it is that act of tremendous love. Because there's only going to be that six to seven years left. And the time of light of that portion over that group is over for eternity. Just like the portion of the bride of Christ, those who have the spirit of God at the escape, there's no more. It's over. There is no more those who are of the spirit of God in the first portion. They're gone. So what's going on here in Romans is the first group with the Spirit of God in them living in the portion of time of the flesh <clears throat> and being reminded not to be caught up in the things of the flesh. But we know that when it comes to the church, they got caught up in the things of the world. So when Christ comes at the beginning at 40 days after the bride, the sons of God, those with the spirit of God, those who are co-heirs crying, Abba, Father. When they're gone and Christ begins as the son of man for 40 days, what is he coming to do? Bring them light. He's coming to shed light and let them all know to come to him. Unfortunately, the majority, the vast majority, are going to think that he's the Antichrist or not believe who he might be and will reject him temporarily. This is awesome. This is awesome. This is deep, deep. This, oh, it just blows me away freaks me out, <laughs> blows my mind. <coughs> now watch this. That first group that we're talking about in the spirit, right? We, we kind of touched on this earlier. We know that they're connected to Taurus. This was, this was a huge revelation we got. <coughs> Excuse me, a confirmation that we got back in March of 20... Was it 2020? Yeah, back in 2020. That's right, just over two years ago now. Oh my goodness. And we find it here. We shared this a couple times recently. To the early Hebrews, Taurus was the first constellation in the Zodiac and consequently was represented by the first letter of their alphabet. Aleph. Aleph. Ox, the head of the ox, the beginning. Who is the beginning? What is the beginning? Genesis 1 verse 1, in the beginning. So where do you think this connection should be for the bride of Christ who is connected to the beginning, which was Taurus? Do you realize when Taurus is? Now, this is, a, this is the sun not accounting for the moon included. Because with the moon included, it goes a little bit further. But as of 2008, the sun appears in the constellation of Taurus from May 13th to June 21st. This, brothers and sisters, is the time we've been sharing this year for, oh, just since late last year, which goes from here to here from the seventh Sabbath of the Feast of Weeks to the beginning of the 50 days right here and the escape of the Bride of Christ after seven days, probably early in the morning on the eighth day, Jerusalem time, and look at where it is. What is it? June 21st. Why? Because it's in Taurus. It's in the beginning. Why is this important? Because it is the beginning. It is the first position. It is Christ, the cross in the middle of the three feasts of the Lord. It is the feast of weeks that was the first 
uh, um, covenant that he ever made with man. Do you understand when, when Christ came, we know that he came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel and the Gentiles that got grafted in. Do you realize that when he came, did he come to save John? No. <laughs> Why didn't he come to save John? Right? Why didn't Christ come to save John as well? Because John already had the Spirit of God within him. John already had the Spirit of God within him because he was a witness to the light. The bride of Christ are those that have the Spirit of God within them, who are in Christ. They are the sons of God and have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. You see, then it goes on to talk about the creature. What is it saying about the creature? For the earnest expectation of the creature, which is the Mark group, is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Do you know what that says? It's, it's telling us that the Mark group, unbeknownst to them, because the church is asleep anyways, they're not aware of it. But you could say probably Lucifer is waiting for it. The false light, that Antichrist spirit, is waiting. They're, the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. What's the manifestations? The vanishing. They're waiting for those with the Spirit of God to be removed. Do you know why? Because that's when the Antichrist Spirit is released. That is when the power goes out for the enemy to go ahead. To really go ahead. End of days craziness go ahead. You see? Christ will come to bring light when the bride escapes. Amazing stuff. Watch this. It gets even better. We come into 1 Corinthians 15. And I came into this because a brother had posted a question about, um, about the dead in Christ. You know, when will the dead in Christ be raised? And <clears throat> I've talked on it in the past. And we're not going to go into every part of it. But what I am going to say is it all goes back to Matthew. Or it's all because of Matthew. In all of the centuries, having been taught from the foundation of Matthew, we look at Matthew, and when we read anything related to being changed, anything to a pre-trib or mid-trib or, or a vanishing or, or a changing a body or anything, everybody wants to think it's pre-trib. Or if they're mid-tribbers, they put it at mid-trib, but they all bundle it together because it has never been understood until this ministry that there are separate periods of time over separate people. And you're going to see this even more now. I just covered, as we were covering Mark stuff, then we went into this Luke to be able to show that those who are of the Spirit of God, who are gone first, who are witness to the light, they're gone. Then that Mark's group, a portion of time takes place. So what do you think Mark's portion of time should be? Those with the light. And that they're currently in the flesh. Okay? That they're currently in the flesh, but what happens? Well, they're also of the kingdom of God. But they're not in the third heaven kingdom of God, remember? 2 Corinthians 12. The first group goes to the third heaven. The second group goes to paradise. Then we see the third time, the typology of Paul here is as the Lord coming the third time, and it's him coming to them. So the first one is an escape, then a rapture, or pre-trib like a rapture, and then rapture of the great multitude, 
And then at the end of trumpets, him returning feet down. So this first two, they're both a taking away. We know this, this great multitude rapture is going to happen at uh, um, the time of Passover in the seventh year of seals. Okay? Let's go back. 1 Corinthians 15. And watch this. Because remember, what people in this mixing up are forgetting is as as we've been following this, and if you've been in the, the ministry for at least a little while, we we know that there are these three different groups now. Okay, we've known it for, for many years now. We've shown it, as we said, from every angle you could possibly imagine in hundreds of ways. So when we look at these things, we need to carefully examine what the wording is telling us to be able to say, well, wait a second. I used to believe that there was a resurrection of dead people receiving new bodies at the time of the rapture. Well, there, there is no grave in the sense opening at the time of the rapture. <clears throat> not even not in the pre-trib either. Remember what Paul said? Paul said that to die is gain, right? To die is to be with Christ. But he says, but it's better for me that I'm here now for your sakes. But I would much rather be done from this world and be with the Lord. Why on earth would you need a resurrected body to be in the third heaven? Doesn't it, it, doesn't, it doesn't even jive. There's nothing that, why would you need a body to be living in heaven? Okay? You're going to understand what this wording is as we read this in 1 Corinthians 15. Because as we've read this in the past, and as you've read it when you would have been um, in the seven-year thinking, what happens is we read it, and we think it means a, a new type of, of body like we have, but maybe one that could walk through walls or something. No, that's not what it says. We have no need for this body anymore. Listen to what it says. Let's start in verse 44. It is sown a natural body. That's what we have right now. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. In what? A natural body. So the first man in the flesh being made a living soul was Adam. The last Adam, people want to say, well, Adam's not Christ. <laughs> well, he's the typology. It was the beginning, the light, and the flesh. And by the way, that's John chapter 1. Sounds like Genesis 1 into Genesis 2, doesn't it? Why? Because he was the first over everything in the spirit realm as well. He was the first over the light, and then he was the first over the flesh, because what? The first Adam, but he's the last Adam. When, when the first Adam was made, he was made what? A living soul in a natural body. The last Adam, Christ, was made a quickening spirit, a spiritual body. Was he covered in flesh? Yes, he was. Did he have blood? Yes, he did. At his resurrection, did he get a new body? No, it's a spiritual body. There was no need for seeing graves rip open and, and, and receiving a new spiritual body. But we will talk about that actual body, don't worry. Then we see in 46, how be it, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural and afterward, that which is spiritual. That's because when, see, not only was the first Adam made natural and then Christ made spiritual, Christ was also, when he came, natural and then was made spiritual, a spiritual body. Now listen very closely. This gets awesome. The first man 
is of the earth earthly the second man is the lord from heaven listen carefully as is the earthly such are they remember i told you earlier <coughs> as is the earthly such are they also that are earthly Did you hear that? That means there's a group that are earthly. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. Meaning there are some of the earth who are made for the earth, who were promised the earth, who were promised the kingdom of heaven on earth and there are others who although in the image of the flesh covered in the flesh they actually bear the image of their creation in the light are you ready and as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Who was this image created in, brothers and sisters? Oh, you got it. You got it. I can hear you guys yelling it. Exactly what he told the Mark group only. The creation, when God made them male and female, he created them in his image, but they got corrupted by the false light of Lucifer. And here they are now. Here we are, right? We're all living in this dimension, this time of the flesh. This time of the flesh. But there are those represented by the creation in days when he made the male and female in his image who have been corrupted. They are the creatures that were corrupted. They are the creatures that were worshipped above the creator by those of the false light. And here they are dwelling in the earthly they are dwelling <coughs> in the time of the flesh. But guess what it says? And as we have borne the image of the earthly, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly. Watch this. Born the image of the earthly. Look at what it says. To have a burden to wear as clothing. This is to the church, guys. This is to the church that will go through seals. They are wearing like we are, but we saw in Romans that the bride of Christ, those with the Spirit of God, even though they are in the flesh, they are not of the flesh. What is he now telling the church? He is telling them, look, you guys might be living in the earth, but you are not of the earth. You are not earthly as those who are earthly. You are not earthly as Adam is earthly. You are dwelling in the time of the earthly, but you are not earthly. You are covered in a clothing of flesh, in the image of the earthly, but you shall bear the image of the heavenly. And what was that image in them that he came to bring? The light. The light. Because they first got corrupted in creation by the false light of Lucifer. He was the true light that they were created in <coughs> when he made them male and female in his image of light. But we're now dwelling in the dimension of the flesh. And this group 
in the dimension of the flesh that he is talking to here are going to be upon their death or upon the time of the twinkling of an eye when the time of the rapture of the great multitude comes will be made into that heavenly image of light once again as is the earthly such are they also that are earthly and as is the heavenly such are they that are also uh, also that are heavenly the rapture group is also heavenly they are part of the kingdom of god listen to what it says verse 50 now this i say brethren that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of god <clears throat> you see there is no new type of body of of graves that need to open and so that you could walk through walls or whatever you think it might mean there is no need <clears throat> for that type of body ever again in heaven in the third heaven or in paradise it is a spiritual body no longer the need for this natural body but we're missing something aren't we we've covered two groups romans told us those that are of the spirit don't worry about this flesh don't get caught up in it because you're actually spirit and we know when that bride go when that bride goes we know those who have the spirit are the sons of god those who have the spirit of god man that's pre-trib that's the luke group now here we are <coughs> in first corinthians 15 and we're seeing that this that this fleshly portion this natural body is is a temporary he's telling those who are looking for that spiritual body that they're that they're covered in this clothing uh, in this fleshly clothing right now but when their time comes they will bear the true image of their uncorrupted creation which was light mark's group the creation group in days leaving us with one more group it leaves us with a group that's called the third group who is this third group the flesh matthew's group the jews the portion of the seven thousand that were living in their time right now even though there are those of the spirit covered in the flesh there are those of the light covered in the flesh there are those who are also made flesh and that was the third creation or the third group in the creation story that third group is the flesh created of the dust of the ground and where did the lord god put them in the garden they were put in the garden of eden <coughs> where does this land in the typology of time beginning of trumpets all right the beginning of trumpets matthew's portion of time matthew's portion of time so if if lucifer came and was the one who corrupted in the creation of days the light he corrupted and was the false light and corrupted them look who shows up but the antichrist the same typology coming to corrupt them during the time of seals and then he'll be destroyed at the end of the sixth seal and then here we are in the typology now in matthew's time in their seven thousand typology in their end times seven not days but years in the end of days at the seven trumpets what happens in this typology now doesn't lucifer come uh, uh, uh satan then come the serpent the seraphim that was above the throne he comes 
at about the three and a half year mark. And what does he do? He's going to step into the actual physical temple that was made and corrupt it and destroy and go after them and make war for two and a half years because that's the last time. His time is short. Then he's going to be cast into the pit for the millennial reign. You see the storyline going on here? So Matthew's group is what? Matthew's group is the flesh group. Matthew's group is is the is the uh, uh, um Adam group. It's the one that the Lord God created for himself. That Satan corrupted and they were where they were in the garden. Do you know what's fascinating about this? You guys have probably heard on this heard about this before. I've taught <coughs> on it in part before because this is always such a beautiful developing story about the creation. But do you know that Jews don't believe in heaven? And what happens is they they don't believe they go to heaven. Okay? They believe they're I think like this holding and then they're going to be resurrected at the time of Messiah, at their time for their millennial reign in the last day and so forth, okay? And they'll be at paradise because paradise will have returned again, right? And they'll have their millennial reign. Well, when you go read on this, you're going to read, some people say, well, no, they actually believe in heaven, but in a different sense. No, it's a different sense. They don't believe that they're going to a heaven in that sense. The Jews don't believe it. And that's because the heaven is not for them. Remember, it is Luke's group and Mark's group that are the portion of the kingdom of God. Judah's portion and promise is the kingdom of heaven, which is heaven on earth, which is their millennial reign. Okay? What they believe in, in connection to the afterlife, is often you. Uh, uh, it often uses it interchangeably with the term Gan Eden or the Garden of Eden, referring to a heavenly realm where souls reside after physical death. Did you see that? Did you hear that? They're waiting for the Garden of Eden. Not only do they say they believe that they're waiting there, they believe that they will be resurrected to the Garden of Eden. Listen to what it says. To use the generic term Garden of Eden described as heaven suggests that the rabbis conceived of the afterlife as a return to the blissful existence of Adam and Eve in the garden. Before the fall, it is generally believed that the Garden of Eden, the, uh, that in the Garden of Eden, the human soul exists in a disembodied state until the time of bodily resurrection in the days of Messiah. You see, brothers and sisters, they don't believe in heaven as we do because heaven is not theirs. But we have been sucked in to this believing of these things. Not, I don't believe purposefully. But Christians would go to Jews and they would they would debate these things back and forth with the New Testament and the Old Testament. And they all came into this seven-year thinking, this 7,000-year thinking, instead of the 14-year thinking, instead of the 14,000-year thinking with this first mystery seven to show the truth of it being 21. But the house of Israel, Judah, the New Testament, the the, the, the church and the Jews, the house of Judah, they are seven and seven. 7,000 is days, 7,000 as the thousands of years. But because they've all seen it under the same banner of Judah, Christians, see seven years and the timing like the Jews. And so what happens when the conversation of the resurrection 
of the bodily takes place. Well, do you know where that comes from? You see, it is the Jews with their promised heaven on earth who are going to receive this bodily resurrection. But Christians have it so confused because they're seeing from the same view as Matthew, you see, that they believe it's for them. It has nothing to do with us. Look at what the Bible tells us. In Romans chapter 11, it starts in verse 9. And David saith, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Remember, it's kind of like uh, what Isaiah 2 says, right? Who will go, send me, right? That's a typology of Christ, send me. And he says, make their hearts fat, make their eyes blind, plug their ears. Because if you don't, maybe they'll recognize it and be saved. <laughs> I mean, it's the craziest thing. I've mentioned it a couple times recently. It's the craziest thing. You would think that's what you want, but it's not God's plan. So see, they, it's been made a snare and a trap for them not to see. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always. This is why the Jews didn't recognize Christ. They were blinded. But it was for our benefit. It was for the world's benefit, which is the house of Israel and the Gentiles grafted in. And then it says, uh, verse 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid but rather through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world, meaning two things, one, the Gentiles, the house of Israel, the, the world is now going to benefit because of their fall, but it also means because they're God's chosen people and during this time of fall, he's giving them the riches of the world. That's why they control everything. That's why for the small nation, they're the most Nobel Peace Prize winners. That's why they control and own so many things. Some of them are Jews. Some of them are fake Jews. We get that, right? But they were also given the riches of the world because they're his people. So he didn't just leave them with nothing and abandon them. He gave them the world. But then it says, and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles. So while they get to gain the riches of the world during their fall, that diminishing of them brings in the riches for us spiritually, okay? But they're his people. They're his chosen ones. So then he says, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify in mine office, if by any means I may provoke them to, uh, I may provoke to emulation, them which are my flesh, huh, because why? He was a Jew. To them which are my flesh and might save some of them, okay? Because they weren't completely blinded, but mostly blinded. Listen to what it says. This is the answer. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be? but life from the dead. Theirs is going to be mind-blowing. The graves are going to open up. When? At the last day. It's just like Daniel was told, right? In Daniel 12, at the very end of Daniel, but go thy way till the end be. For thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. That's at the end of tribulation, at the end of it. You're going to stand in your plot. So what's he telling them? What's he telling us? That the resurrection from the dead that Christians generally think has to do with them has nothing to do with them. The 1 Corinthians 15 isn't telling them about a, a physical body coming back from the dead and the graves opening. It's talking about being made a spiritual being 
type of physical, not, not physical, but a, a spiritual body in heaven for them in the heaven portion of the kingdom of God in paradise. But remember, there's going to be paradise, this kingdom on earth. Remember when the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives after the battle? He's going to what? Water is going to flow from the temple in Jerusalem. And it's going to restore and replenish everything. And they're going to have their kingdom on earth. And they're going to be raised from the dead. <clears throat> you see, this is why when we go to Matthew and we read as we did just recently and you read the resurrection story from the synoptic discord uh, from the synoptic gospels of Luke, Mark and Matthew. The only place you see where the graves are opened and the dead went into the city is Matthew's death and resurrection story. Those who are what? Of the flesh. Those who are of the earth, earthly. And even though we are all currently earthly covered, there are those throughout the earth, a small portion, who are currently in the earthly covering, who have the Spirit of God. They are the bride of Christ. They are the sons of God. They are the John the Baptist at the time of his birth, who are the typology of the witness who came before the light. They are those who will be taken before the light, who are those who have the Spirit of God in them. Christ does not have to come for those in Him. He is coming for the lost. And when He comes for those 40 days, He is coming to shed light on those who are lost, who are the ones from the creation of days, who were corrupted by the false light, who must be brought back and be made aware of the light that is within them. That when he returns at the end of the sixth seal on heavenly Mount Zion and leads them into the promised land, to the time of the rapture, as Joshua did. It will be then the time of Judah. And the time of the light will now be done as the time of the Spirit was done. When the time of the light is over, the days of the church age is finished. And it will turn to the age of the earthly. And when the time of the age of the earthly is finished, those who were promised the earthly millennial reign of peace on earth in their own land, each tribe receiving their own portion, just as precisely we're told in Ezekiel chapter 48, it will be the millennial reign, and those who were laying in their plots that were the Jews of old will be resurrected from their graves, given new bodies. And it will return to those days. It will return all the way back to those days, to the time of the Jews, to the time of Judah, to this portion of time when it all began, where they lived for hundreds and hundreds of years. It will be their portion of time in the earthly as Adam was made of the earth 
which is the third portion creation, which is to Judah, to Matthew, the light to Mark, and the spirit to Luke. The spirit is the feast of weeks. The light is Passover. And the earthly is the feast of tabernacles. Escape, pre-trib. Rapture, mid-trib, seventh year of seals. Return, feet down on the Mount of Olives. At the beginning, at the end of the 13th or the beginning of the 14th year, feet down. And as he says, after we read this resurrection story, of those who slept, who were there from the foundation, or, or I mean from, from the beginning, who were told to lay in their plot because they are of the earth, earthly. He then tells us at the very end of Matthew that he will now be with them until the end of the world. That's the end of the millennial reign, brothers and sisters. When this end of the world happens it will be the end of not only what was the 21 year story and the 14 years of tribulation and then a millennial reign that will carry on from this jubilee forward for a thousand years when the story is all over it will have been from in the beginning to the very end from the aleph to the Tav, 21, and then the 22nd thousandth year. It is the spirit. It is the light. It is the flesh. That was so awesome. Man, <laughs> I know some of you are going to need to watch this more than once. I'm still, I'm still sorting some of this throughout in my brain. As I keep putting more and more of these pieces together, as I'm led to understand them, it is, it's mind-blowing. It is so awesome. Like, just reading this again, in a way I'd never read it before. Did you see that this video, guys, that this entire teaching was from like a half dozen conversations with you guys through comments, through, through direct messages, through talking on the phone? Do you know what got me going down this through this with light and spirit being covered in the flesh and so forth was a call with our brother Mark. I talked to him usually a couple times a week for a little bit, and he went to a conference with his wife, a, a crazy, let's call them church conference, where they think everything's already happened. And Mark, he had to go for his wife, and, you know, that's a whole story. But he said while he was listening to them, <laughs> He said that the woman said that they are the light. They're the ones who have the light. And Mark told me that he said in his mind, he says, you're absolutely right. You guys are the light. I'll take the spirit. <laughs> and it got me going down this trail. And I, and I started realizing, I mean, we, we've taught this, but not to that wowness of what he said. Not to like the, the awareness of saying, oh my goodness, that's right. It was the spirit, the light, the flesh. It was Luke, it was Mark, it was Matthew. Which means, yes, of course, we can still have the light of Christ in us, but we're not of the light. The bride of Christ is of the spirit. Would you rather be Romans 8 or would you rather be 1 Corinthians 15? Isn't it funny that the, for, the, for the majority of the church that teaches on end times, they love going to 1 Corinthians 15 to say pre-trib? You know why they do it, because they have their foundation in Matthew. So where do you think that puts them? At the end of Mark, which is precisely this. See how crazy that is? See how awesome that is? The spirit, the light, the flesh. We've even got a video that says the beginning, the light, and the flesh. Because Christ is the beginning at the spirit realm first. Then made flesh, uh, uh, then made light, then made flesh. 
You see, there, there's no need to save those in the Spirit. And I mean Christ coming to save them in the Spirit. Yes, we needed Christ to be able to receive that Spirit. All right, we needed Christ to come and save so we can be saved. But those who were of the Spirit were already predetermined. Because when he was coming, he wasn't coming to have to save them. They just have to be removed because the time of the Spirit is over. Do you understand why the tribulation of seals is also taking place? It's to wake up those who are to have the light in them, who were his made in his image back in the creation story. But do you understand why the intensity of seals is coming? Why it's going to be so crazy when the escape happens and craziness breaks out and Jerusalem is attacked and then attacked and they're gone for seven years? And then during that seven years is the tribulation of the church or the world. The first two and a half years is World War III and famines and pestilence and chaos. That's only the first two and a half years. When Antichrist gets that power and authority to continue 42 months for that second half of seals, it says it's going to be worse than it all the way was back to the creation in the days. What happened at that time? Lucifer. Lucifer corrupted the males and the females that were created in light. But it's going to be worse than that. Mark 13 said it would be worse. This is why I said in the last video, people that think we're in tribulation don't know what they're talking about. They haven't understood what the Lord meant when he said, shall be affliction in those days, shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of the creation unto this time. All the craziness that you've read about in Old Testament and New Testament craziness at the persecution. This portion at the time of the Antichrist, the, the new Lucifer false light is going to be worse than even the first one and everything since. Guys, this is serious stuff. Why is the Lord though allowing this? To destroy the false light and to bring those who remain in his light, those who are his, even though they may not be aware of it, to light that light within them and take them back because they're his. They got lost. They're his. Not one. Remember, not one will be lost. Everybody who is meant to be saved will be saved, whether now or whether during the tribulation of seals. Not one in the world will be lost. That light will save them. And by allowing the false light to rule during the time of the second half of seals, when it's over, he can destroy them. And bring all those that are his light back to him. With their spiritual new bodies at the rapture. This was gangbusters, man. So awesome. You know, we didn't talk in Matthew because the focus was this was this first portion, right? <clears throat> but don't forget, as I finish this up, don't forget what the Jews look for. The Jews know that their time is the resurrection that will be in the Garden of Eden. Well, the Garden of Eden comes at the end of seals, right? Paradise comes. And they're being brought to it as well. But then we know when Lucifer comes, he's going to corrupt it. Just like, not Lucifer, sorry, Satan, when he comes, just like he did with Adam and Eve. And so what's going to happen? They got the same thing, but slightly different. He's going to step into the holy place that will have been built. And then listen to what it says. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world. It's not the same context, is it? Since the beginning of the world. 
Marx was since that creation of Lucifer's corruption. This one says it's going to be even worse at the midpoint of trumpets when Satan is cast down. But then he says, no, nor shall ever be, meaning it will never be worse than this ever again. It's going to be worse than Mark's midpoint, but after this midpoint, it will never be this bad ever again for eternity. Why is he allowing these things upon these two groups? To bring them back to him. To save them all. To save all who were his in the creation of days for the second group. And then the Matthew group to bring about all those back to him. That, that Judah group with their stiff necks to take the blinders off. And when it's all over, all those who were his from that time back of Adam and Eve will be resurrected to be given new bodies to live in their earthly portion. Awesome. 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 Awesomeness. Hopefully that 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 sunk in, you understood what was being what was being taught. You were able to to see those connections. Go watch it again. Watch it in portions. Pause it. Rewind it. Go and seek into those scriptures. Dig into those things. If you're new to the ministry, come back and watch this fractal one. I think it begins here. Maybe it begins in this one, but then a lot of it is explained in this fractal one. Go back and watch those too. And you'll understand what is being said here a lot more. Because brothers and sisters, I hope and pray and believe that everybody listening to this now and those who are in our homes, I pray we are all those with the Spirit of God within us because those with the Spirit of God are the pre-trib sons of God, bride of Christ, who will be co-heirs with Christ, who will be witness to the light that's coming and will do it from the third heaven. I love you guys. God bless you. God bless your families. I'm so pumped up now. It's almost midnight. I'm not going to bed for another couple hours anyways. <laughs> All right. I love you guys. God bless you. Bye for now.